Welcome into a special edition of the Inside Carolina Podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt, as always. Jason Staples is here. Look, in the middle of the madness that is March, I know, I know that there's some Tar Pit Premium folks that are very much jonesing for football content. And there might not be a ton of them with us tonight, but there'll be a lot of people to listen to this. Um, and just for planning purposes, folks, Jason and I are going to talk about spring takeaways. And then tomorrow is North Carolina's Pro Day, March 28th, Thursday. Jason and I will be in Chapel Hill observing that. And we'll drop a video show with for that somewhere on site, depending on the weather. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It won't be live. It'll just be recorded. And then all of this will be buttoned up into one big football podcast audio version that you guys can get on your feed and enjoy it all. But anyway, what's going on, Jason? It's been a while. You know, you mentioned basketball, and I just want to I want to take a little bit of a victory lap about being one of the one of the people who is absolutely adamant that Hubert Davis would be would be would be the dude that he he needed to be at Carolina. Uh I was you remember I was confident about that guy that he was he was the right call and that he would have a lot of success and I think we've seen that. So I'm, and I'm, I'm really happy to see it because I mean I'm I'm a Hubert Davis fan, so really uh, really glad to see that. It's amazing how the ebb and flow of uh, be it fan bases or observers that watch programs, and especially this day and age, are quick to jump on folks early and you know sort of not give them them their chance to sort of breathe into the role and all and. and Hubert, yeah, I mean, I had some doubts. I really had some doubts early. And uh, to be honest, the job he's done with this bunch and building this bunch. So it's they got be a, heck- a chance now. They got a chance. And that's all you – you can't win it if you're not in it. And yep. You get the, you plays. get enough at-bats and you win them. And, you know, this team's going to have a, have a real shot. And Absolutely. I'd love to see my old AAU teammate, Sean May, uh, get another ring. So – Nice. Well, there there's some great basketball games that will be going on over the next couple of days, Thursday and Friday, and then into the Elite Eight. Um, but we're going to talk football here. And, Jason, I guess it's been a week. Um, I guess last Tuesday, last Monday, we had Mac Brown's uh, introductory to spring press conference. Everybody that's on this has seen that. And then we sort of talked to uh, Mac there. And then Tuesday, you joined – myself and the rest of the inside Carolina crowd for open practice. And then over the weekend, there was some coaching clinics with practices going on, but wanted to do sort of a a five takeaways so far in spring, what we've gathered and what we've seen and what we've heard. So I want to start with you and let's try to, let's try to say five. Um, I think there's a lot of them. The new faces highlight spring practice is sort of what I've titled this, Jason, but I'll let you take this wherever you want, right out the gate. Start with number one. Number one thing that has sort of caught your eye thus far this spring. Uh, Number one is I expect the offensive line to be better. So, uh, you know, I got to to see him those two days. And just I think the overall quality of bodies on the roster has has improved in terms of, of what they have across the board. I mean, obviously, losing Gaynor, who... Uh, actually got to talk to him a little bit at, at, at practice and, and it looks really good for him to, uh, to get a chance or to, to, he's, he's likely to be drafted in the, in the late rounds. Uh, and as he put it, you know, he just wants to be able to have a Jersey and some pads and put, and put a ball in his hand and he's ready to roll. He doesn't care where and how late the, how late he's picked. He just wants to get on a roster and re- and be ready to roll. He thinks he can compete and, you know, as healthy as he is, he's the healthiest he's been in a long time. He's going to have a chance there. So even losing him, though, I think the overall mix up front is better than it than it has been in terms of quality and depth of bodies. And, and of course, you lose another guy who's probably going to be an NFL guy as well, who played left tackle last year, who shall remain nameless at present, uh, moving on to a different school, being poached by higher NIL and all that. But they went out and they... I think they added some quality and I think a few of the young guys have some, have some potential too. 
Uh, I think Blasky is a hit at, at center. I think he's going to be be really good. I'd like to see him get a little stronger in the lower half and anchor a little bit better. Um, you know, uh, but I, I think he's going to be he's going to be good at center. Uh, and I tell you what, <laughs> seeing Howard Sampson in person, you, we we were talking about this in that open practice, like. Ooh, that that guy looks and moves the way a left tackle supposed to look and move at this stage of his career, and you know he's he's in my view he's already the best offensive tackle in the roster, uh, and I think he's going to be a pretty uh, you know no worse than average in the ACC in his first year as a starter in the ACC, and I think he's going to be probably a good bit better than that. So uh, I think I think and a, he's, and a perfect he's and a perfect hit. name to to you and I'd start to step on you, but I got to say a perfect name, <laughs> Samson for a man that yeah. size. I mean, just a monster yeah. of a man. He is absolutely enormous. And and the thing is, right now with with the two with the two tackles they have out there, I mean, you're not going to find a bigger, taller, bulkier pair in the country. Uh, and both guys can actually move pretty well. Now I do think. Uh, we also saw Jakai Leftwich. He was in, he was in town. Uh, you know, he's walking around practice. He can't practice yet because of the uh, because of the timing of the transfer and everything. But you know, Leftwich is another guy that I think is going to come in and, and play right away. And you look at him in person, and again, he looks the part. I mean, on the hoof, you go, okay, yeah, that that guy checks out. He he ticks the boxes. So, and and frankly, I wouldn't be surprised to see him as 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 a starter day one. Uh, just based on what I saw of him at, at Georgia Tech. So you look at that, I think they, they did a good job of scouting and bringing in the guys they needed up front. I think the offensive line will be better. Uh, the other thing that I think was has been evident through the, the little bits that I've seen is the payoff of having the same offensive line coach and a good offensive line coach two years in a row. This being the second year for Clem is, I, I think already paying dividends you're seeing guys that are not looking as lost as they did at this time last year uh and i think clements being here for for a second year is is already you're already seeing the benefits of that so i do think the offensive line is going to be better than it was and i think they'll have a little bit more depth across the 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 line as well when you you know a lot of people say well they lost so much and they weren't great it that's the thing about the transfer portal here, and that's why the transfer portal has really changed the game so much is you've got the ability, and, and let's talk about this for a second, and you, and you went there a little bit, but the ability to bring in completely fresh new offensive linemen despite what they lost, despite who left, and it starts at center. We saw how important Corey Gaynor was. You mentioned Blasky. Um, you can't overstate having an experienced guy come in at that position. But just from a purely, like you call it, off-the-hoof view, this bunch can be much better. Talk a little bit more about the importance of having Randy Clements in his second year because that's what people have sort of missed in the offensive line deal is they've had three and three and now they have some consistency over the last little bit. How important is that for these guys to have some consistent coaching from the same person? I mean, it's all football, and you all do basically the same things, but they, it's just been crazy for this bunch. And now you have new bodies new and it's a consistent coaching, and they've brought in some grad transfers to help and some analysts and all that, but just that important part of it, Jason. Yeah, everybody – the thing is, every – Offensive line coach has kind of his own flavor, just to, just to some degree, in terms of okay, inside zone. Everybody's going to step with that right foot. It's going to be roughly a six inch step. You're going to follow that with a good, strong second step. There are certain fundamentals that are just fundamentals. But some offensive line coaches are going to want that step to be a little more vertical. Some want you to stick on that on that double team just a little longer. Some want you to move from that double team to the second level faster. There's all sorts of different things that basically having continuity in place allows you to really to allows guys to gel a little bit. 
And yeah, the thing is, when you bring in, new, you know, a bunch of new guys and they're bringing in, I mean, you've got Blasky, you've got Samson, Leftwich, and then Greenberg, who we also saw on the hoof, and he actually looked pretty good uh, You just on the hoof. I mean, he's not Leftwich. I mean, Leftwich stands out, but uh, you're bringing in four transfers. So in that sense, those guys are having, have a new offensive line coach, but everybody else who's on the roster already knows this is how coach wants us to do this drill. This is how we, you know, how we, how we're going to combo. This is, this is how we're going to handle doubles. And, and so even when you have new guys coming in and being integrated right away, they're being integrated by, uh, along with other guys who already know what they're doing to some degree. And so the, the learning curve is, is expedited with different things in the offense and all that. So I think that that helps a lot. Uh, I also think that this is, it's not just the second year under Randy Clements at, at the offensive line uh, spot. It's also the second year in this offense where you're seeing guys who understand, okay, this is, this is how we, how we're going to do this. This is what coach expects. This is, this is how we're going to run. These are the plays that we're going to run and we're going to run them this way. And you can start to see coaches, you know, add some wrinkles off of that, you know, down the line. And and there were definitely wrinkles in there. We're not going to talk about what they were, but you know, you could see some of the things that, the, that it's the next step of some of the stuff that they, that they were doing uh, schematically that, builds on what they were doing last year we didn't see a lot of it last year and some some things it's like oh i see why they why they would do that given this personnel and 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 it just makes sense and that's the stuff you can do when everybody already kind of has a sense of what the basics are and what the what the installs are for the early stuff you can add that extra little thing yeah and to your point before we move on those guys have the size and the one that does not have the size is the nastiest one on the team and that's willie lampkin and yeah, so, and I see in the que- in, in the chat, Thomas Yancey asks, "Does Blake have the leadership potential of Corey Gaynor?" I, I I can't answer that fully. I mean, that's something that's hard to assess from where we're we were seeing things. But I will say, it's not going to matter that much this year because Willie Lampkin is the is the leader of that group. There's no yeah. question about that. He he is the vocal and spiritual leader of that group. And when and when he's hollering at guys, he's hollering. And uh, you know, I I saw one guy get beaten one-on-ones when they were when they were going up against the defensive uh defensive uh line and Willie Lampkin absolutely chewed his teammates butt out for a fundamental mistake where he came in and he 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 started shouting exactly what that guy had done wrong fundamentally and just you know, I'm not going to talk about what it is because it's not you know that that's inside baseball to some degree or inside football but you know he started shouting you know do the do this dang it do this and you know come on man you're too old for that you know and and basically putting that accountability in place that's there i do think they have leadership up front and it it you know it starts and ends with with willie lampkin there yeah and if folks are watching this or listening to this later have not watched willie's post first day of spring practice youtube um, that adam got up that we were there completely different guy Lampkin same player but different man young man in the way how he he spoke about it he he has found his footing at North Carolina and he plays with a chip and if he can get his teammates that don't have his same reason for that chip on his shoulder to play that way I think Carolina will be fine on the offensive line it's gonna be interesting to watch because I, I think part two of this question or part two of this podcast Jason and I'll take it this way is everybody's talking about the quarterback competition and (laughs) and everybody's saying well they'll take a step down from Drake well every team in the country just about would take a step (laughs) down from Drake May and we'll see if you're watching this on Wednesday Thursday Drake will perform for the pros that we'll be at as well to talk about tomorrow but it's not unrealistic to think, uh, or it's very realistic to think, that they will take a step back from the quarterback position. But let's talk about them, Jason. We saw a lot of Max Johnson. We saw a lot of Connor Harrell um, when I was able to be there. They've got a couple other guys on the roster, Merdinger, Tad Hudson, but it really comes down to Johnson and Harrell. And, and what you see and what do you think so far? I thought one thing about Max Johnson, that's a big man. You know, Drake. <laughs> Drake's not a small guy. But this guy's bigger than Drake, and um, when he wings it left-handed, 
it, it comes out a little different. But, uh, yeah, he's got – you talked about on the hoof for the lineman. This guy's on the hoof looks great, but what would you see from him? Yeah, he throw, he's, he's a guy that throws a really pretty football. I mean, you look at him in drills and what he's doing against air and all that, and, you know, he's putting the ball right on the spot and spinning it like a pro. I mean, there's no doubt about his, about his arm talent and the ability to put the ball in, in, in di- into different spots like that. Um, you know, first day when we saw him in seven on seven, it was a bit of a, a bit of a mess, but that's first day with a bunch of rookie wide receivers. Everybody needs to remember this spring and this, this will really be number three in some sense. And it has to do with, with the wide receiver unit and just the youth that you're getting on offense. That's getting an opportunity to play. Uh, the guys that are going to be out there next year, JJ Jones, Blackwell, Pesor, are not playing. They're not out there right now. They're all taking the spring off because they're all recu- recuperating from being banged up la- at the end of the season. So you have a bunch of guys who are, you know, first and second year players in the program that are playing at at at, uh, at wide receiver, and you get out there with with Max that first day, and it's the first time they've all been out there like that. And, you know, a lot of balls hit the turf in that first seven on seven session. Now, the thing we noticed is as soon as they went team, went 11 on 11, all of a sudden, some of those balls got completed. All of a sudden, you know, Max Johnson steps up in pressure, puts, locates the ball and it's in on target and it's caught. And so something clicked as soon as they went 11 on 11. Uh, and, and I think, you know, with, uh, you know, with, what he what they're bringing to the table in the, in the passing game. I think they're going to be good enough in the passing game to be able to supplement what they're doing in the running game. And and I think Darwin Barlow is obviously, you know, again, another guy that on the hoof, there's no question. Like he he came in, you look at his hips and thighs and and core and all that. That guy's going to be a hard guy to bring down and I, I think he might be a little burstier than 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 even the coaching staff thought he would be coming in. I I think they're really pleased with him. Uh thus far in terms of, of what they what they got. He's going to be a really good complement to to Hampton. You put those things together, and then the quarterbacks are just having to manage the football game and get and make good decisions and get the ball out. And I think both of the guys so far, and you know, I don't think I'm revealing too much to say that the second day I thought they looked a lot better than they did the first day when you know when I had the chance to see him at the clinic, uh in the clinic practice. I thought the quarterbacks actually played well. I thought they, they, they did well. Max actually had a really good session in both 7-on-7 seven seven and in 11-on-11. 11 11. So, you know, the, I think quarterback is going to be fine. Is it going to be Drake May? No. But is it going to be probably top half of the ACC? I would expect it to be. And, and I think they've got the pieces and all of that around them to do that. And if they can be better on the offensive line, which was an issue for Drake May, especially, I mean, Drake got hurt last year. A lot of people didn't know this, right? But when Drake May got banged up and got hurt against Virginia, that changed them for the rest of the season. If they can keep their quarterback protected a little better up front this year with the guys that they've got, that's going to help them. And so I think quarterback will is something that is going to be helped by a lot of that, that's going around around those guys. Yeah, and when you've got running back like Amari Hampton, you mentioned Barlow, uh, Caleb Hood, if he stays healthy. I mean, they've got guys there and we're going to talk further about the the rest of the roster but somewhere along the line we've gotten into this game manager stuff is a negative give me a quarterback that can get the ball where it's supposed to go and protect the football and not throw it to the other team a lot he doesn't have to be superman when you have omarion hampton and you have barlow and those guys that are running for seven eight yards a carry just don't turn it over just make sure you get it in their hands and you get it to those guys, the other guys' hands. And a lot of folks listen to this, and this is what's something we can talk about more, but a lot of folks listen to this and say, oh, they're setting us up, you know, because this guy's not going to be any good. He doesn't have to be great. He just has to do his job. And I think that is a very, very important thing. I don't think – I'm going to say something that is probably not going to bear out, but I don't think J.B. McCarthy is a, is a great quarterback. He's getting, He's going sky high in the draft. Um, but Jaden Daniels versus J.J. McCarthy? Is that what we're talking about here? Those type things? I don't know. Maybe I'm just reaching there. I just think Carolina expectations 
about the generational style quarterbacks. I don't necessarily think you have to have it to have some success. I guess we'll find out though, because Drake's yeah, and, not going to be suited and, up. And the other thing, the reality is that McCarthy, regardless of how good he is, the way that Michigan ran their offense and called their offense, they didn't ask him to do a ton because they handled their business at all those other spots. And they just turned to him and they said, okay, well, you know, it's second and four and we're going to take a shot. Can you put it on your guy? Okay. It's third and eight. We're going to, we're going to need a, we're going to need a conversion. Can you get nine yards for us? That's where, that's what you're looking at. Yep. And, and in that sense, I think they can, they can do, they can do well with the guys they have on this roster at those positions. Now, those young guys, and this will be number three for me. All right, so let's we'll go make ahead, this go. number three. Yep, let's go. Those young three. wide receivers had trouble getting open against the secondary. That's not because those guys are not college level players. They're young players at wide receiver. But that back seven, I thought was again, this is another unit that's having its second year under under uh a secondary coaching staff, right? This is the second year under Jason Jones. And the second year where you're getting those guys, those corners that are being coached well. He's a good coach. And having Huzzy on the outside, having some of those guys, I, I thought the secondary was a was a pleasant surprise in terms of how active they were, in terms of how sticky they were in coverage. And I thought both backers handled business pretty well as well. I mean, I thought both 17 and 23, so that's power and, uh, and what, uh, Cam uh, Campbell, uh, those guys, you know, you can see powers experience, but Campbell move well. And, you know, I, he's not, is he going to be Cedric gray? No, nobody else is going to be Cedric gray on this roster, but I, I think Carolina's back seven projects to be a good bit, another step forward compared to what they were last year. Partly because of personnel and, and getting some guys healthy, getting Huzzy on the outside where he can be a dominant corner out there. Uh, number zero, who's uh, he's the freshman whose name is escaping me right now. Um, he he was another guy that really stood out multiple times when I got a chance to to watch them because he's just so quick and so active around the football has, you know, he's one, there's certain guys who find the football and he's clearly one of those guys, which is great for a guy that's going to be in that slot corner type role. And, you know, I, I think, uh, I think they're in, this is the deepest and the best group in the secondary that they've had probably. Oof, it's been a while. It's been a long time. And yep. I think they, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be pretty good in the back seven. That's Ty White back there a freshman yeah that's right. defensive back and it's interesting you look at their listings ties listed at five nine and a half 185 stick lane five eight and a half at 195 similar size guys i think lane's a little smaller there but yeah they've, they've got some guys quicker. yeah they've got some guy they've got some talent back there and it's only gonna make these young wide receivers much better i mean we talked about you, know, you can talk about jordan ship you can talk about alex taylor and all but Culliver and and Paul Billups and, and those guys, Christian Hamilton, those guys, I think they've got the skills there. they got to figure out the proverbial wide receiver one that everybody always talks about. But with if there's a blessing in injuries, all of these guys being out, J.J. Jones, Blackwell, you know, Nesbitt on the tight end side, Copenhaver on the tight end side, you get all these other guys some quality reps. So I think you're right. They can figure out the wide receivers, and they can get solid production there. I think the quarterback position is just a position where you just get it where you're supposed to. You don't have to, you don't have to win the games for us like they needed Drake to do, but you can't lose it for us. And I think that's a key thing for North Carolina to build off in the spring. We're talking with Jason Staples here on the Inside Carolina. Somebody in the chat. I think Debo's backpack said, why are we talking football when we got a Sweet 16 game? Because we can do more things than one at once. And we're talking football tonight. Basketball, of course, tomorrow. Pro Day tomorrow. Jason and I will be talking football again tomorrow ahead of that. Uh, so it'll be an interesting time 
there is no off season in South Carolina, and uh, we know that at least 130 of y'all love some Carolina football at the moment, and we wanted to bring it to you. Jason, let's go. What's four? So, by Def- the way, three three on the crawl should be DBs, but um, four. So four uh, is going to be defensive line. All so, right. yeah, for me, that's going to be to me the season. This season hinges on whether or not the defensive line can take. They really need to take like two or three steps forward, but can the defensive line? advance and and be a solid to good unit going into next year that that to me is the season for north carolina it's all about whether or not the defensive line gets there they cannot be like they were last year for this team to be successful period yeah there were and and again i don't think i'm i'm breaking confidentiality here and saying that you know we uh we heard a few things from from the coaching staff hollering at those guys specifically in practice uh such as don't put that blank on tape and uh you know i told you guys i loved you but that doesn't make me mother teresa (laughs) so you know you're gonna you're gonna get this right dang it so you know at this point though it's all talk right we we don't know what that group's going to become. I do think that the current staff that's working with the defensive line, and that includes that go, that goes from uh, from that the you know the the main D line coach to the GA to all the way down to the analyst that they just brought in from LSU. You know, all of these guys are are good coaches, uh, and you know I think Monachino. If you put truth serum, <laughs> if you had truth serum, if you put truth serum into Mac Brown right now and you asked him, okay, gun to your head. If you had to go back to last year, knowing what you know now, what would you do anything differently with that group? And he'd say, yeah, Monikino would have, would have coached that group from day one as the position coach last year. If you had truth, I'm, I'm just going to say, I, I suspect that that's the case. Because remember, when he hired Monikino last year, they thought Monachino, based on the way that the rule was going to go, that that the, that analysts would be able to coach yep. on the field. That was the plan, was that this guy was going to come in and be an additional coach, and then you've got your the guy that recruited all these guys, and he's there, he's still recruiting, he's a really good recruiter, but you got this guy to be the main coach in practice. And then there was a switch, and that wasn't able to happen. And then all of a sudden you're stuck with a yep. different situation, and like I said, if you had truth serum, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm guessing that that would be the answer that you would get. And, and that's because if you watch, you know, Monachino is, he, he's a, he, he's a good coach. Yep. Um, the question is, I, I thought watching practice that you know they're a body or two short in that defensive line room to be at the level that I would like to see, especially a defensive tackle in terms of depth. If you look at the front line guys. Des Evans, I think everybody knows what he is at this point. He is who he is. And he was a good player last year. He's not a bad football player. He's, a, he's an above average, I would say, plus level football player in the ACC. And as a, as a run, run, defend, run defender, as an edge setter, he's, he's a good player. I think Rucker is an NFL player. I've said that for three, what, three or four years now. I would pound the table for Rucker as an NFL scout. I want him on my football team. So you feel good about those guys. You you've got some players. You know, Travis Shaw has all the talent in the world. Is he going to actually buy in and and be and you know buy into the accountability and all of that? You know, is Jacoby Cowan going to take that next next step forward? You know, you, you've got some guys. You, you know, Hester is another guy that's a He's a he's he's another big body on the inside. How much more can he add as they get a little bit better in terms of their uh, in terms of their overall uh, uh, fundamentals and all of that? I mean, how much how much more are you going to get there? I did think that there were some guys, you know, a couple of the freshmen, uh, the 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 redshirt freshmen, and then the other the 
the guy who's a true freshman, I thought were encouraging, you know, in terms of the bodies, in terms of that. But I think they're, I think that the issue is once you get past essentially Rucker and, and, uh, and Evans, uh, on the edge. Evans on the edge, I just, I've still got concerns. And once you get past Hester on the interior, I want to see evidence that, that those guys are going to be where they need to be. That to me, and, and you can't know through a couple days of practice, and I, I'm looking at those guys on the hoof, it's just, it just feels like they need a little bit more. And I'm, not, I'm still not super, super confident in that group. And they're, you know, I'm, I'm living in Missouri when it comes to UNC's defensive line at this point. It's a show-me situation. And spring is going to be a big part of that show me because, you know, if things keep going like they've been going with the improvement of the offensive line, you're going to see a spring game where Carolina is going to be able to run the football whenever they want in the spring game. And that's not what you want to see. You want to see the defense be able to get some stops up front. Yeah, You mentioned young guy, Joe Starlin's defensive yeah. lineman, 6'4", 320, just, just a monster. Yeah, I liked him a lot. You know, Janai Norwood is a freshman as listed off offensive lineman. He was also out there body That's wise. Fifty six, right? Yep. And yeah, you got man, a, I, he was another good body, and and he moved really, really nicely. Yep. So they've got some talent there. The question is, can they step it up? And you know, it, it's kind of like I said on the offensive line. If if they can all channel Willie Lampkin over there, well, if they can all channel Cayman Rucker. On the defensive side, if if he can pull those guys along to get them to play, even if the talent level is different, just to play as hard as he plays, I think Carolina's got some ability. But you're right, I think the back the back four will be fine. You know, getting Huzzy to corner is is a big deal, and they've got some talent there. The linebackers are going to miss Cedric Gray, but you, to your point, they're going to be fine. The and, and further to the point, defensive line has got to step up. You know, yep. somebody in the chat said we've been waiting on a guy like Travis Shaw forever, and, and that's the case. Uh, I mean, it is now or never for some of those guys. We'll see if it if we'll see if the Monacino effect. You know, if you want to go to the league, what better coach to have? Somebody that actually coached some of the best in the league, and he's telling you, this is what it takes. You have to do this to get there. If you do it, you can get there. If you don't do it, well, then it's on the player to sort of perform. Yep. So, so Starlings, I'm looking at my you know my numbers in the notes, and I'm going just by numbers because I don't know all these guys yet. But Starlings is a guy that definitely stood out to me, just in how he moved and the overall body and all of that. He's a guy that that with a good spring and a good off season, he he can be a uh, a basically starting rotation guy in my view. He's got that kind of that kind of body and that kind of uh, that kind of upside for him as a young guy. He, he's, he, I, I really like what I see in him and, and, you know, we'll see what happens there. Shaw is going to be as good as he wants to be. Yep. It's just for him. It all comes down to want to and buy in. And is he going to buy into the, to the, the difference in accountability that's being brought by this, by, by, by this change in, in staff, is he going to buy into the attacking mentality that you've got of the defensive coaching staff and, you know that's that's the question i think uh and that that to me is going to is going to turn the season you mentioned rucker by the way watching rucker in drills is an absolute joy because he does everything right like i'm talking about everything like and everything with careful attention to detail everything all the way down to the you know it's not just doing it correctly it's doing it correctly with with utter intensity on every dang drill on every rep there's one point where they're doing a tackling drill and uh, rucker comes in and does it and you could see the, the you know these are new coaches that are working with some of these guys and coach kind of goes like dang rucker that, that that's, you know, that's great rep. And then turns to the next guy and goes, do it like he did it. <laughs> Cause it's just over and over and over again. That guy does everything right. And yeah. So, you know, again, if, 
you if Rucker can just get a little bit of that to rub off on Shaw, if Shaw can can fully buckle down and and get and buy into the accountability and all that, you can only lead a horse to water, and you can give him salt. And you can do all this stuff to try to make him thirsty, but it's the horse's choice at the end of the day. And it's, it's, you know, now it's time to go. It's, it's time for him to, to be that guy. If he can be that guy and then you get the development out of starlings that it looks like you might be able to get now, all of a sudden you got a defense, but there's some, there's some question marks up there. Yeah. I mean, there's Bo Atkinson is a guy who who's shown major flashes when he's got the opportunity to see if he can, Get some more snaps. He's yeah, always on the him, but he, he he's another guy that does everything right in drills, and he's another yeah. guy that that you can see he's packed on a little bit go, a little bit more good weight. Uh, so he you know that's that's further depth there. But again, that's another edge guy. You feel best about your edge, but on the interior, you gotta you gotta be able to hold up a defensive tackle, and that's really where my concern is right now. Yeah. So we we'll, something to watch the remainder of spring, something to watch of off season into the fall and all. People have asked, will Carolina add more defensive linemen in the portal? We'll see. I mean, who knows? It's the Wild West. <laughs> and, you know, it's one thing to say you need more. It's another thing to actually go out and get them or be able to land them. So we'll see what happens. The portal, of course, opens after spring practice. Um, so we'll have another round of – another round or two of who's playing what, jersey swapping and all that kind of stuff. Jason – Number five, what's your fifth thing here? Because we've covered offensive line, quarterbacks, defensive backs, and the defensive line. Um, we got one more before we get out of here here on a Wednesday night. I'd say it's energy, and that's the, the energy that the new defensive coaching uh, – that the, the defensive coaching change basically represents. Uh, and, you know, being around the program last week and listening to various people – from uh, who've been around for a while, you know, asking them, okay, really, like what's – what, what, what have you seen different so far? You know, that sort of thing. And just trying to get a sense from players of like, okay, what's really different? Like, how much is different? It's not so much schemes defensively. It's a matter of the emphasis on doing things with utmost intensity. And uh, <laughs> we, we, we talked about this. And actually, this was something that, that came up in the uh, – in the uh, uh, coaching clinic as well. They, they, uh, he put it up on the screen as well for the coaches where uh, Collins at the beginning of every meeting has a PG warning, uh, you know, PG 13 warning of like, I love you guys, but I'm going to get passionate about this, right? We're going to play this way. And, uh, and, you know, Collins presentation at the coaching clinic was not about scheme. It was about how to get guys to buy into playing defense like your hair's on fire. That's basically what he's what his thing is. And and the the sense that I get, and this is, you know, there's some excitement from the players and just other folks in the building. The sense that I get is that Collins has really connected with those with those guys and that they're ready to run through a wall for him. That's the sense. And you can see it a little bit in practice. There's there is more energy on that side of the ball. But, you know, this is the question for me, and, and that's all good. You can see that energy. The question for me is how quickly does that ultimately pay off? Where are we going to see the, where are we, when are we going to see the, the, the results on that? And are these guys really going to buy in, in full, in terms of, of skin in the game, putting, putting their money where their mouth is? when the bullets start flying or are they just kind of enjoying the, you know, the, the, the new, the change and, 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 uh, and feeling some of that energy, but not really making that pay off. That to me is the real question. You, I don't think we can know that at this stage, but, uh, but I, you know, I think that's what, that's what they needed. It's just a matter of, of whether that's actually going to connect. So to me, the, the last two, so the first three, I think, are all positives. The last two are where the question marks lie. I think the, the, that the early returns on number five look positive, but it's too early to tell. And number four is a huge question mark, you know, at yeah. least on the interior. I think they're going to be fine on the edge, but on the interior, they've got a lot of work to do, and they've not been real good in there for a while. 
So on the defensive interior, the defensive tackle spot, that's that's really the spot that I think is going to determine how good this team's going to be. It's all about blocking and tackling, and it's all about the trenches, and it ultimately always comes back to that. I agree with you about the energy. Cayman Rucker talked about, and for some reason this twerked up some people. Um, he said basically Collins came in and apologized in advance uh, of how it's going to be, and uh, I asked Cayman about how did other guys take it, and um, he basically said some guys are going to have to get some use, getting used to and understanding that um, hard coaching is not hard criticism. It's coaching and all. And so it's going to be an interesting take to your point. And uh, they're, what, midway through it or not even midway through it here in the spring. And something that you also talked about with the energy thing, and I'll wrap this into the basketball um, moment that we're in. Hubert Davis at the timeout against Michigan State said, we're not even talking about anything basketball related until we join the fight. <laughs> I love and, that. You know, that was great. I mean, that was it's an so awesome good. thing. And it's like, and he's right. And it's the same with the football. Until they get their energy to the level that it needs to be and the passion and, and playing hard and running through the walls, all the other stuff doesn't matter because you're going to get your butt kicked by teams that do it. And we've seen that multiple times with North Carolina football. It is if I play harder and we're equal, I'm going to beat you. Go ahead, Jason. Let's wrap it up and get out of here. So two quick things to wrap. Uh, one is when you're when you're looking at this, something that's often not really considered in in this equation is the di one of the difficulties about coaching in college is you have to go out and recruit these players and then coach them, and in some ways those two things, depending on how you how you do those two things. Uh, can be at odds with one another. <laughs> Absolutely. Because what you do when you're recruiting guys is you try to make them love you and you know you befriend them in some sense. Now, in certain places, once you get a program built enough, you can actually recruit on the basis of I'm going to be hard on you. But, you know, that's another thing. And by the way, I didn't mention Javari Ritzy, and he's another guy. He he's a guy that absolutely looks the part right now, but I want to see him I want to see him prove it between the whistles. Yep. He, he looks in the best shape he's ever been in. Uh, but I want to see, I want to see it between the whistles from him. He's a guy that could be an NFL player if he wants to be. And if he, if the fundamentals get fixed, that's another guy I did not mention. I didn't mention Atkins or him, uh, but you know, kind of because I take them a little bit for granted, but, uh, but Ritzy is another guy. If he steps in and becomes that dude as a, as a, you know, interior player that solves a lot of problems. Um, but, Getting back to the other thing, uh, when you have that kind of um, uh, that kind of effort and that kind of uh, that kind of push from your coaches, that helps. Sometimes it helps to be coached by the guy that didn't recruit you, because the guy that recruited you. The relationship is such that like he maybe maybe he's not the guy to give you the pg-13 warning and climb all up on you to be the to be the the heavy there and i think a few of these guys got comfortable and you know i think the the, the change is going to make them less comfortable because some of the, the because these are not the coaches that recruited me and i'm gonna and they're gonna you know they're gonna ride me uh and i think that's a that's a factor second thing and this this will wrap on I'm still an old man yelling at clouds on one, on one major thing. And that is when I watch spring practice these days, I cannot but shake my head at the difference between a, sp a spring practice, like, you know, what we're seeing now and the sort of thing that I went through, you know, 22, 23 years ago. Because for us, it was a point of pride to make it through all 15 practices of spring practice because basically everybody got hurt by, by the end of week, week one, week one, one and a half. Because you'd start first day of practice, first day of, uh, of um, you would start the first day of pads with like Oklahoma, which nobody does anymore, or, or bull in the ring, which nobody does anymore, board drills, which nobody does anymore, and... I'll be honest, I do think 
and you know, some people may disagree with me here. I do think Carolina would still benefit from a little bit more from, from tossing a couple of those sorts of things in there a little bit, you know, maybe the old fashioned board drills or whatever. And, and, you know, or some, some equivalent to that. Uh, and I would love to see, I would still love to see, and I, and they may, they may be doing this. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I would still love to see them, you know, finish practices with, you know, eight plays on the goal line, four from the, from the good on good four from the, you know, second unit. And, you know, whoever gives up a score on, de- you know, if the defense gives up a score, then the offense or then the defense runs. And if the offense give you know, scores, then they run. So it's, you know, there's stakes at this. I- I'm old school on some of this stuff. And I would just love to see that kind of thing still. I know very few teams do that now, but I think that's the sort of thing that if I were, you know, if I were writing a prescription about the, you know, line of scrimmage and the toughness in the Carolina program that I think has, you know, is, is what really needs to be added for next year. I'd go right there and I go, okay, every padded practice is going to have a goal line component where it's full live. And then, you know, at the end, and then, uh, you know, have to include a few, a few other of those sorts of things. And again, very few teams do it. I'm an old man yelling at clouds going back in my day, but that's just, I got to get that off my chest. That's just the way, I, that's just the way I think. No, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a valid thing. They, things are different these days and, and not necessarily bad, but different. And it's funny, I was in Carmichael last night at a um, 50th thing, General Alumni Association did a 50th thing for the eight points in 17 seconds against Duke, which was absolutely fabulous. It was unbelievable. And I don't want to spoil it too much because it's out there for purchase, I think. But um, former player back then talked about Dean Smith and said, I'm not sure Dean Smith would survive in these days. Um, with how he ran practices and how hard they were and how difficult they were. Um, so, yeah, things are definitely different. But North Carolina, in the middle of spring practice, pro day tomorrow, we will be on site checking that out. And uh, Jason Staples and I will get back together for one of these in person to talk about what we saw at pro day. And uh, But if, if you got here late, I saw somebody ask, I think it's one of our regulars, asked uh, could you see the video this video will be up on youtube immediately i'm going to combine the audio from this to our show tomorrow into one podcast for later um, but jason it's always fun to talk football um, hard to believe you know and you know how time flies it'll be august before we know it and we'll be doing this um, and we will not have had an off season because why because there Cause is no, there is off, no off, season. off season and in south carolina jason let me before we get out of here 167 folks in here Go visit Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Get all your swag. Get your Carolina football gear for next year. You know you're going to be back in. You, you, you know you said you were leaving. A lot of folks said they were leaving. You'll be back in Kenyon Stadium, and you need the swag to wear to the games or wear on the road. And uh, they've got you hooked up. 10% off your order if you're inside Carolina Premium. And then also congruity, congruityhr.com, front slash Tar Heels, for your free assessment for your small to mid-sized business. Jason, it will be fun to talk tomorrow. Look forward to seeing you. Um, be there on time so you don't have to army crawl under the gate. <laughs> and um, we we will check in and we'll check out Pro Day. Folks, enjoy your time. Enjoy Easter if you don't get back you don't with us. have a gate code? I don't have that code, but I do have a ladder. <laughs> um, and I can still climb a fence if I have to. It's, it's the other side of the fence that's the problem these days. Uh, but anyway, we'll be there. Check us out. Check out all the covers from Adam, Jeremiah, and the gang out in L.A. on basketball. Jason, it's always a pleasure. Likewise, Tommy.